What's up YouTube, and welcome to the next episode of my PS1 Publisher Spotlight series. This is my series where I take a look at the full catalog by specific publishers on the PS1 that I at least admire or am somewhat interested in. So today we're going to take a look at the full catalog of games published by Tecmo, and it is 13 games in total. Kind of a weird mix of selection that they put out on this system. Uh, Tecmo obviously has a long history going back to the early 80s with arcade games when they were known as the company Taken and then they rebranded themselves to become Tecmo in the mid 80s and released several hit franchises on the NES such as Ninja Gaiden, Rygar, Solomon's Key and uh, several others, te uh, the Tecmo Super Bowl franchise that became long-standing favorites of gamers. So, really, when you see how Tecmo evolved into the 16-bit era, it was a lot of rehashes of the stuff that made them famous on the 8-bit era. And then when they moved into the PS1 era, I think they were kind of directionless. This kind of feels like, overall, a B-tier publisher that was releasing C-tier content on the PS1. So I will say that some of the games you're going to see today aren't exactly classics. However, this uh, company still does interest me. They've obviously hung in there. They've now merged with Koei, so now their branding is Koei Tecmo which I think is kind of a good fit considering both of them were on the fringes of Japanese publishers at the time and probably merging the two together uh, was best for both companies. So with that said, let's take a look at their PS1 library. One thing I will say is that they did start several successful new franchises on the PS1 and that's probably the thing they're best known for as far as uh, how they evolved from the PlayStation 1 era. So the first one of these is one of those new series. This was the debut of the Dead or Alive fighting game series. And this was a pretty popular title, but I would say that honestly the series grew in popularity after it left the PS1. I was a huge fan of Dead or Alive 2 on the Dreamcast, and even to some extent Dead or Alive 3 on the original Xbox. Uh, this game I didn't own back in the day. I think uh, DOA 2 was my first game in the series that I owned, but I definitely played this every once in a while, um, you know, whenever I had the chance couple things about this game is this is a 3D fighter um, that does move very quickly. The, the matches are over especially fast. And uh, while we didn't get a Ninja Gaiden game on the PS1, unfortunately, uh, Ryu Hayabusa is one of the featured fighters in the game, just going by the name Hayabusa to leave it up for ambiguity. Uh, a couple other things about this game is that Graphically, it's okay, but I would say that it wasn't of the tier of some of the Tekken games that Namco was putting out, um, but obviously holds its own compared to some of the early 3D fighters on the system. I think the other thing that this game is infamous for is its jiggle physics uh, for all the female fighters in the game. They are cartoonishly ridiculous, um, but obviously that was something that grabbed attention and press at the time and uh, was, I guess, giving this game some popularity. So. Uh, it's an okay fighter today, I guess, to go back and play, but I would much rather play some of the sequels that are better known. Uh, the series carried on probably much longer than it should have, and I don't really think there's a whole lot of fans of the series today, even though there still seems to be a trickle of DOA-related rela releases. The other thing I like to look for when uh, going over these publisher uh, spotlight series is consistencies within the packaging that some of the publishers brought. And so one thing you'll see on several of the games, but also kind of inconsistently, is that Tecmo would sometimes put in the top corner or one of the top corners what type of game it was. So I guess that could help uh, clueless parents that were buying a gift for their kid, whether this is something that their kid might like, or even just directing traffic as far as uh, what type of game the, the gamer could expect if they're shopping this in a store. So in this case, it is a martial arts fighter, just for notation. <laughs> So then we'll take a look at uh, a chance that Tecmo took that in the long run probably was smart, but at its time might have felt a little weird. They released a horse racing game in the United States. So horse racing game in Japan, obviously not unusual. These date back to the 8 and 16-bit era with a grand popularity in that market. Uh, but the U.S. was not really open to horse racing at this time, or at least nobody had thought to take a chance on it, other than Koei, coincidentally. Uh, who released Winning Post on the Sega Saturn prior to this game. So I think technically this is the second horse racing game that we ever got in the U.S. It is a sim. It is very detail-heavy. It is not, not my type of genre at all. Uh, but it does have an arcade mode that you can at least flog the horses and you know try to have a traditional race. Um, but overall, definitely not my type of game. Uh, while the game is called Gallop Racer, I believe this was Gallop Racer 2 in Japan. There was an original one that also came out there even earlier on the PS1. And then, uh, obviously, just for numbering's sake, they, they gave this game the first game in the series for the U.S. 
Um, I think this game was, you know, reasonably popular because then when Tecmo moved to the PS2, they put out a ton of Gallop Racer games. There's, I think, three or four different games that came out on the PS2. So overall, it worked for them in helping uh, get the franchise rolling in the U.S. and bringing some of the popularity that horse racing sims have in Japan uh, to this market. So while niche, it was, I guess, a good idea in the long run. Uh, next, we're going to get into quite possibly Koei's biggest success, uh, or not Koei, Tecmo's biggest success on the PS1, and that is the Monster Rancher series. Uh, there was a little bit of a mania caused by this game in the origins, origins of the PS1 whenever these first hit the market. So here we have the original Monster Rancher game, which spawned a huge franchise that goes on through several consoles, portables, you name it. Uh, people love the Monster Rancher games. But this one was very unique for its time. As you can see, it is a virtual monster breeder, is the genre of game. <laughs> and uh, really what I think the timing of this game in particular did very well is that it is uh, very clever in that it utilized technology from other CDs and games and PC uh, releases that you owned on compact disc. So the idea was that you would load up the game in your PS1, but then if you wanted to import new monsters, you could pull out any CD from your library, pop it into your PlayStation, and suddenly you have a new monster that you could use for breeding or fighting purposes in the game. Very clever. I mean, people had large CD collections at the time, so it was kind of like a mad dash to pull out all your classic CDs and pop them into the PlayStation and see what is contained within them. I don't really know 100% how the technology works. I'm guessing it's related to the amount of total track time on the disc as far as what monster unlocks. And the other thing I'll say that uh, from this era that was kind of cool is that magazines, tips magazines, would print out, hey, here's some hit CDs that actually bring really powerful monsters if you import those. So I think it even caused a situation where people were buying specific music CDs just to get different monsters in the game. Kind of funny. Uh, so definitely a product of its generation. I think it fits in good with the PS1 history. You know, I think this game is fondly remembered. And then you even get a nice little warning here. Breed monsters at your own risk. So Tecmo was having a little bit of fun there, adding a little extra bonus warning to the packaging. Uh, but very popular game, and obviously so, because soon after that, we got another Monster Rancher game. <laughs> so here is Monster Rancher 2. Um, obviously still a virtual monster breeder for the uh, packaging notation here. And uh, now the series had become so popular in the U.S. that we had an animated series that you could watch on the BKN Kids Network, which I was too old to remember whatsoever. But maybe some of you saw the series, uh, the cartoon series that related to this. The Monster Rancher um, franchise had definitely grown by this point. There was a lot of uh, other releases that were in the pipeline that you're going to see on the PS1 and even other consoles that started to launch as a result of this. So definitely more of the same, but I would say definitely more... Um, polished this version of the game has a little bit better graphics and obviously some new features just to keep it fresh but overall uh, definitely carried the the thought process forward uh, one thing i noticed on mine and i'm not sure if they're all like this but the esrb logo is like really blurry or messed up on it so i don't know if they're all like that or if that was uh, just a, a printing error with this particular copy uh, but one thing that just kind of stood out as i looked at it uh, preparing for the video today so that wasn't enough Monster Rancher, of course. We need more Monster Rancher. So let's take a look at some of the other things that they brought to us to cash in on that new franchise that was doing so well. Here is a game that came out a little bit later, and this is Monster Rancher Battle Card Episode 2. And this is a traditional card battle game with your Monster Rancher characters. The reason it's Episode 2 is that the first game in the series was actually released on the Game Boy Color, and so I guess to not confuse people, the home version of it became Episode 2. Um, I am not a card battle fan whatsoever, and this was not even something that uh, I was going to play. I strictly bought it for the purpose of having this complete collection. However, I was urged by Game Rave TV that I need to try this game, so I did uh, actually pop this in last night, and, and about an hour later, I'm like, I'm still playing this stupid game. So what I will say is that even if you are not a card battle, magic player, Pokemon player, Yu-Gi-Oh, whatever, um, you can probably still have some fun with this because it is pretty simple. I think it was intended for younger audiences, and even myself that was uh, a complete rookie to that genre was able to figure out kind of how to play the game. So... Um, I can definitely see why this, this has its fans, and if you like card battle games, or maybe even just kind of an introduction to those, it might be a good place to start. 
Uh, the Monster Rancher characters don't mean a whole lot to me, but obviously they are all here and present, and, uh, you know, you really choose your, your uh, attacks based on which Monster Rancher characters you have in your arsenal at any given time. So, definitely uh, an addicting game, and I can see why uh, people would be attracted to this, even if maybe the traditional Monster Rancher games aren't necessarily your thing. But that's not my favorite of the Monster Rancher games. We're going to get to the odd side game, and so here we have... Tecmo really cashing in on their new franchise, and this is Monster Rancher Hop About. <laughs> and you're asking yourself, what kind of game is this? Because Tecmo didn't even include the little box to tell me. Well, it is a, a game where your Monster Rancher characters bounce around on pogo sticks and attempt to get from one end to the other of a maze-like level with several obstacles along the way. Uh, it is a very unique title for the PS1, and I have recommended this game to people long before I even really was familiar with the other Monster Rancher games. This was actually the first one I played, and I thought that this was such a cool uh, niche game. It probably feels more like a mini game that's been stretched out to a full release, but honestly, it's really fun. It's got some nice action puzzle properties to it, and I would say even if you are not a fan of the Monster Rancher characters, it doesn't matter. You can still have some fun with this title. It's very arcade action-oriented. Um, I don't really know why Tecmo chose to bring this to the U.S. other than they just thought there'd be a market due to the Monster Rancher characters. But I would say of the four titles, this one probably sold the least. You don't see this one out and about too often. Uh, I think that uh, Tecmo was inspired by the um, gameplay me mechanics of this because if you play uh, Dead or Alive Extreme Beach Volleyball, the very first one on Xbox, it has a hopping mini game where the uh, girls in swimsuits will hop across a pool uh, jumping from, like, uh, pool float to pool float that honestly feels a lot like this title, just kind of uh, in a smaller scale. So I think there was some uh, inspiration that carried forward to that title as well. Uh, but however, I, I definitely recommend this game. If you like weird Japanese PS1 games like I do, uh, this is a great fit, and it just happened to come out in the U.S. for some reason. So that is my favorite of the Monster Rancher series. Next, we're going to take a look at the final uh, Tecmo game that came out in the U.S., and that is Super, so Super Shot Soccer. It's kind of hard to say that. Um, the packaging on this one is quite, a, quite weird, and honestly, I think there was a mistake made. You see on the left-hand side here, we don't even have the uh, traditional black inner lining of the PS1 cases, and I think that um, there was a misprint, because if you open up the tray, you'll see that it's actually on the other side. But they're all like that, so... They never corrected it, and uh, unfortunately, they all showed up like that. Uh, the Tecmo logo is smaller on this one. It's in a different place, and uh, they didn't really have some of the traditional branding you're going to see on some of the upcoming games as well. I think that the purpose of this game was it was a completely unlicensed soccer game. It was trying to be very arcade-y. Uh, there's some just very like powerful, dramatic arcade-style shots and uh, things that you can do inside the game. Uh, just to make for a real arcade experience. I don't really think this game was very successful. Like I said, it was a very late PS1 game. I think it came out in 2002 or maybe even 2003. And the other thing that I think uh, hurt this game was just, it, it was kind of the era of PS1 budget titles. This game probably would have been a good fit at the $9.99 price point. But if I remember right, I think it was a $20 or $30 game when it came out. So it was slightly above a budget title, uh, but kind of felt like one, honestly, in its presentation. So... If you like soccer games and, and, you know, not looking for a true sim experience, it might be fun, uh, but I don't really think that this game has a whole lot of fans. So, interesting they chose to bring that out uh, very late in the PS1 life. So, let's talk about another franchise that uh, Tecmo started on the PS1 that actually had life beyond the PS1 that they carried forward. So, here we have the Tecmo's Deception series. And what I will say about this to start off is Tecmo can be kind of an egotistical game publisher in that they like to put their name in the title of the game. So you're going to see several of those games coming up as we go through the next few releases. So it's not just Deception, it's Tecmo's Deception by Tecmo. <laughs> kind of feels silly. Um, this one came out pretty early on the PS1. I didn't have a lot of exposure to this one until later. Um, but I do think it was interesting. These are trap setting games and they have like kind of a medieval torture type um, theme to them in a castle. And you are the trap setter trying to actually capture innocent people in your traps. So it's kind of a sadistic style of gameplay. Uh, to the point that Tecmo actually had to put a very concrete warning down here. So while the game is still rated teen, uh, it says this game contains satanic references and may be inappropriate for some individuals. 
I cannot think of any other US PS1 game that has a satanic reference <laughs> warning label on it, but that's what this game does. Um, it is pretty unique, and I don't think this game is for everyone. Plus, this first one, the visuals are kind of crude, just knowing it was an earlier PS1 game. But it was the launch of a franchise, and you're going to see some other games that came as a result of this uh, following up. So next we have the sequel, which is now rebranded not as Tecmo Deception. It's called Kajero Deception 2. <laughs> so you kind of have to be paying attention that uh, this is the sequel. Now we are telling people what kind of game it is. It's an action-adventure thriller. And this was actually my introduction to the series. I had this on, I think, a demo disc um, that I really enjoyed, or maybe I rented it just out of curiosity, and I kind of got hooked on it. I thought it was really cool. I didn't actually buy it back in the day, but definitely was one that I, I picked up years later and remembered, oh yeah, I did actually think that was a pretty cool game. Uh, here we have all the magazine ratings on the front, just validating how great it is. Um, the visuals are definitely better in this one. The traps are more elaborate. Uh, does uh, select or does support the dual shock for the first time, so you can get nice rumble whenever a trap goes off, things like that. Uh, but I do think it's a pretty cool uh, series. And at this point, they weren't quite milking it yet, but uh, we get there down in the future. So nice to have that one. Uh, a few years after that, we got the sequel. Now we are confusing the titling of his gin. It does not say Tecmo's Deception. It does not say Kajero anywhere. But in small print, it says Deception 3, and now the main title is Dark Delusion. I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, this one's a little bit tougher to find. It came out a little bit later, and of the three, obviously has the best visuals. has a nice cinematic style that Tecmo was known for. Um, but overall, I mean, it's more of the same. I think Tecmo was kind of milking it at this point. Do we really need three of these games on the US PS1? Probably not, but if you're going to start with one today, honestly, this may be the best place to start, just because it's the most advanced of the three. Uh, but it is just more sadistic trap setting, uh, which is really what the series was known for. And then it even carried on beyond that. There was games on the PS2, there were games on the PS3, and even PS4 and Vita. So Tecmo definitely built themselves a franchise with the success or mild success of these uh, as a niche title that several people bought for years and years and years beyond that. Uh, also, you'll notice that the second and third game get mature rated, so there's no separate uh, warning about the satanic images. You must just need to figure that out yourself, knowing that it's a mature rated game. So then, going back to the egotistical thing and needing to put their name in the title of the game, here we have Tecmo Stackers by Tecmo. <laughs> and as it says in the corner here, this is a family fun puzzle game. So this one was one of their earlier titles. It is honestly just a Puyo Puyo ripoff uh, with some mild changes. The music in it is very weird. It's kind of like a 50s rock and roll techmo or techno style to it, I guess. I don't know what they were going for, but it's pretty bizarre. Um, it's a decent puzzle game, action puzzle game. I like these type of games, but this would never be like one of the first ones I would reach for. And uh, even on the PS1, there's several better ones that you can play. So I think, you know, for a family, if you were just buying this game uh, to have something to play at the time, back when it came out early in the PS1 life, it probably fit the bill. Uh, but going back today with all the other choices you have, it's not really much point in playing that one other than just, you know, if you had some two-player action. So now we get to a classic Tecmo franchise that should have been a huge hit, I think, on the PS1, but honestly really wasn't, at least in retrospect. Uh, here we have Tecmo Super Bowl. And so Tecmo uh, came out with Tecmo Bowl, obviously in the arcade and NES, and then evolved into the Tecmo Super Bowl games on NES and also on the Super Nintendo and Genesis which had several sequels and I would say were reasonably popular. Uh, when this one came out on the PS1, I didn't really hear of a whole lot of people playing this one. Pretty early title as well, and I think they may have heard it a little bit, uh, because people were really looking to evolve to the next gen of uh, football games and other sports games, in that most people wanted full 3D titles by this point. This game does have official player license and NFL license, so that's always a plus. Um, but the thing is with this game is it's actually like a 3D play field with 2D sprites on it. So overall, it kept felt a little bit last gen, I think, to most people because they were looking at things like Madden and Game Day and all the new 3D titles to play. Um, probably wasn't people's first choice, even with the popular Tecmo Super Bowl branding on it. So like I said, I don't think in retrospect a whole lot of people are going for this one, but um, it's interesting that the franchise moved on to the system. And then it kind of killed it, honestly, until we got digital releases years later that uh, brought it back temporarily. So. Maybe Tecmo's, uh, you know, cash-in strategy on this didn't work, and then that's maybe why we didn't see some of those classic NES franchises like your Ninja Gaidens and your Rygars appearing on the PS1 uh, due to the setback with this one. 
So now we're going to get to the last title that they published, and this one's interesting because it has two variants. I'll show you the first release um, first, which is the long box version, and that is Tecmo World Golf. I am not a golf fan, so I can't really comment a whole lot on the gameplay on this one. Uh, but what I will say is that this is an interesting long box for a few reasons. Um, this is kind of known to be, at least on internet lore, the final long box release. And it also appears that the long box was rather short print because everything else had evolved to jewel cases by that point. Uh, the other interesting thing is it's a ridge style long box, which there aren't a ton of out there, uh, which means it has the pasted on artwork, so it's very condition sensitive. So these are always interesting in that case. Um, the other thing I'll say about this is that it is clearly a game that was intended for the Japanese market because all 101 courses in the game are actually based in Japan. So not really necessarily something that's going to resonate with a, a domestic audience. Uh, the other thing I will say about this game is what the heck were they thinking with this box art? <laughs> a super zoomed in, pixel, pixelated uh, shot of one hole in the golf course. I don't know who would want to buy this game based on that cover. I mean, it was just a complete miss. The screenshots on the back look fine, but uh, the front cover is definitely a miss. So this is, uh, because of, I guess, it's late release as a long box, this is actually one of the more difficult long box games to find. Uh, which is kind of, you know, incongruous with the, the rest of the variant collecting I did because usually I collected the jewel case variants because they were the more difficult versions to find of the long box releases. In this case, the jewel case version of this game, super common. You can buy this game very, very cheap in the jewel case. It's the exact same thing. Um, thankfully, that pixelated artwork has been shrunk down a little bit to jewel case size, so it looks a little bit better, but uh, more of the same overall. The other thing I think may have been a mistake is that the Tecmo logo here isn't red like it should be. It's white on both of these releases, so kind of unusual that that didn't get colored in. Uh, but overall, not a whole lot to say about this one, just as other than it has two variants, which is kind of interesting. So that gives you a look at the uh, library by Tecmo for the PS1. Like I said, I have always thought this publisher was pretty cool, but I don't think the PS1 was their strongest platform that they released games for. I think before and after this system, they did much better, so... Neat that they were kept alive through this period, I guess, by launching the Monster Rancher games, as well as the Deception series and the Dead or Alive series. But all of those games went on to larger things, uh, probably more so on other consoles, or at least are known more for their other releases. So that about does it. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the Spotlight series. Thank you for very much for watching. Please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. And I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.